Master in Buddhist Study Sorry. Uh, at Cardiff University, Wales, uh, United Kingdom. His research interests are the history of Buddhism, particularly the spread from India to Central Asia and East Asia, which is China. And his publications include a German translation of the Lotus Sutra, a study of the travel record of the Chinese pilgrim Fa Yan, and a monograph on Buddhist uh, foundation myths and legends. At the moment, he's preparing a translation and commentary of Shanzang's uh, record of the Western regions and is a, a co principal investigator of the research project on Shanzang's uh, trail, supported and funded by Bihar Heritage Development Society. Uh, it's a subject that he's going to be speaking to uh, us about. So, welcome, Professor Deek, and uh, over to you. Thank you very much, Seema. Thank you for the invitation, uh, which came, I understand, uh, through Seema, but uh, has been organized by um, you guys uh, up there on my screen. Uh, thanks to you as well. Um, I'm, 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 I'm very happy to be with you. Um, I would be much happier, of course, to be with you in Delhi directly, but for obvious reason that can't happen, but I'm sure we will still will have occasions to one or another to meet up uh, at some point. Um, yes, uh, I will talk about the project. Professor Bauer has uh, introduced uh, very briefly to you um, in the introduction for which I'm also very grateful. Thank you very much. Um, so I think uh, we now should share screen. Ah, here we go. Um, visible still like before? Yes, yes. Okay, good. Very much so. Um, now I have to adjust the little list of pictures to the right side so that I can see as much of the screen as, as possible. I had this experience before when, when you have all those pictures, then the very nice pictures, because you at least have a, a kind of an impression of an audience. Uh, then sometimes you can't read the full fledged slide. Uh, I think this will work in this case. It looks good. Okay, so my, uh, my presentation is called On the Xuanzang Trail, an interdisciplinary reading of the record of the Western regions with a focus on Bihar, or uh, in, of course, ancient terms of the region of Magadha. Um, before I go, uh, so the whole, the whole uh, presentation will be divided into, let's say, three parts. I will first uh, introduce uh, my sources, so the texts, um, and uh, then uh, give you a short introduction to the already mentioned uh, ongoing research project. So uh, we are combining more or less two projects. One is my own individual one, uh, doing that translation and commentary uh, of uh, Xuanzang's record of the Western regions. And uh, the other one uh, you will see is the project uh, which I have in Bihar. Uh, together with my uh, uh, with my other principal investigators and some other colleagues, and then I will go on to two case studies from that region. Um, you will see that uh, in a in a moment. So first of all, the first part uh, contextualizing. So this whole thing will be about contextualizing. If I'm sending out a message in terms of how how to say methodological approach, I would say contextualizing is the keyword. Uh, contextualizing uh, into modernity, uh, you see here a picture uh, of the Buddha Jayanti, uh, one of the many celebrations uh, on occasion of the Buddha Jayanti, 2,500 years of Buddha's birth, um, 1956, uh, so all the way back uh, to uh, into the history of uh, the young uh, India. Uh, this is a picture obviously taken uh, at Nalanda. Uh, Jawaharlal Nehru on the left hand side, on the right hand side, uh, the Dalai Lama, much younger than he is uh, nowadays, still at that time on a mission uh, from the People's Republic of China. Uh, and he actually, what he does here is, you can see here in the middle, he um, offers and uh, or donates on behalf of the Chinese government uh, to Nehru uh, a portion of the relics of Xuanzang. Uh, which then is nowadays, I understand, I've never seen it, but uh, um, personally, but it's nowadays housed in uh, the Nalanda 
in the uh, in the Nalanda Shenzhang Memorial Hall, which we will see in a moment as well. So this kind of highlights how important at some in some periods in modern history, even uh, this guy Xuanzang, this Chinese monk who traveled to India and st uh, studied and stayed in India uh, for uh, about uh, 13, 14 years, uh, how uh, impacty this uh, person actually really is. And you probably know this as uh, historians, whenever you open the book uh, on the medieval or early medieval history of, uh, of India, uh, you will certainly not escape uh, Xuanzang. He will be appearing at one point or another. The more recent political uh, uh, importance of Xuanzang is here demonstrated that's already passed because the relation between these two guys on the photo isn't as good as it was at that time in 2015 when uh, Prime Minister Modi visited China, uh, invited by Xi Jinping. Uh, the president of the Republic, uh, People's Republic of China, and of course had to be brought uh, to the place in Xi'an, uh, the former capital of uh, China, Chang'an, uh, to the place where uh, the big uh, moderator between the two cultures, Xuanzang, as he's normally taken, uh, has stayed, has done his translations when he had returned from, uh, from India, and had built this uh, marking stone, uh, the, the so-called Great Wild Goose Pagoda, in front of which you see both politicians with the abbot of the monastery. We go to India, uh, there uh, the footprint uh, is clearly visible when you go to uh, visit Nalanda, or let's say the archaeological site, not very far from the archaeological site, probably some of you have already visited it, uh, is the Xuanzang Memorial Hall, uh, which is of course built in the shape of a Chinese uh, 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 monastic hall, uh, and Xuanzang in this typical uh, kind of iconographic uh, feature standing in front of the hall visiting uh, the monk who obviously wants to enter the memorial hall. Now, this is our hero, Xuanzang. Mm, uh, he, well, his living uh, dates are not 100% uh, clear. Uh, some people argue he lived between 600 and 6064. Uh, the, uh, the date of death is, uh, is, is safe, but uh, the date of birth is not. A 600, a 603 is another one that shouldn't bother us. So you see him again in, in, in the typical iconographic um, way as is normally depicted uh, according to a, a temple scroll from uh, Japan originally, uh, <clears throat> where he's seen as a um, wandering monk uh, with uh, a rucksack uh, on his back, a lamp dangling in front of him, and here on, uh, on this uh, rucksack you see, of course, the sutra scrolls which he brought back, he allegedly had brought back from uh, India, from Nalanda, mostly to China. On the right hand side, you see a popularized version of him. He even made it into the uh, famous uh, Amar Chitra Katha series. Um, uh, so he has a, a little booklet of his own. Uh, a lot of this, of course, is very uh, hagiographic. We will talk about this uh, in a moment. Now, the main textual sources, the historical sources are, um, if you like, uh, two main sources. One is Xuanzang's autograph. Uh, which, uh, according to uh, Chinese uh, records, has been written down. I have doubts about this. I think the, the work is actually Xuanzang's, and his uh, his uh, student or pupil Bian Bianqi uh, just was writing it down and had no creative input uh, whatsoever. So I am treating the text as an autograph, as a kind of memory of Xuanzang of his uh, travels to and uh, in India. The text in Chinese is called the Da Tang Xi Yu Ji, the record of the Western regions of the Great Tang. And it is important, uh, again, in terms of textual contextualizing, that this is a text uh, which was written on behalf and ordered by the emperor of the Tang, of the Chinese Tang um, uh, Empire, the second emperor of the Tang dynasty uh, of Taizong, and was submitted to the throne one year after Xuanzang's return uh, to China in 646. I will call the text subsequently just record because obviously the full English title is too long. 
Uh, the second text, which very often, uh, which you very often come across when you read about Xuanzang, maybe sometimes even more often than the autograph, is a, an extensive biography in five chapters, while the autograph, the record, has 12 chapters, the biography by uh, a monk and a disciple of Xuanzang's by Hui Li, uh, written after the death, has five chapters. I have, I'm sorry, has 10 chapters, the first five chapters actually dealing with the travel, with the journey. This has an impossible long title, this text. It's called Da Tang Da Zi En Si San Zhang Fa Shi Zhuan, the biography of the Tripitaka Dharma master of the great Zi En Monastery of the great Tang, Tang Dynasty. And again, I will abbreviate that and just call it biography. So these are the main texts uh, about Xuanzang. There are, uh, there are two other biographies, which more or less, not always more or less, confirm what you have in the big biography that is listed here. To give us a kind of a geographic contextualization, this is a map of Xuanzang's journey in India. Uh, and I would like you to uh, treat such maps with some care because this map looks as if Xuanzang traveled along all these uh, these green lines that are running through the whole subcontinent. In some cases, we can show by contextualization again uh, that uh, he has not visited the places he describes. So this description, of course, is also a very fuzzy term. You have to be very careful. We have to look case by case how much is description and, of course, how much is a projection by the author. Uh, in some cases, he clearly says that he never visited uh, the places he des describes. For instance, Sri Lanka is described relatively extensively, but he clearly says, I've never been there. Uh, Nepal is another case where he says, well, I've never been there, but still gives a, a description. The part of India I will turn to uh, in a couple of minutes is, of course, uh, the northeastern Gangetic Plain. It's the, uh, it's the region of Magadha, um, which I have chosen uh, selected uh, for a very obvious reason, because it's linked to uh, the research project I will talk about in a moment. To get a full-fledged picture, again, contextualization, uh, we need to look also, when we are dealing with Xuanzang, at uh, other Chinese travelogues, other Chinese Buddhist monks who went to India and in some cases left <coughs> uh, records, travelogues, as I call them, also not 100% uh, correct. Um, uh, uh, and the earliest of those is the first one. I actually researched uh, a, a Buddhist monk called Fa Xian, who traveled uh, to India already at the beginning of the fifth century, stayed there about the same uh, uh, time uh, length as Xuanzang, but of course in a quite different India, as you can imagine. Xuanzang was there uh, in the first half of the seventh century. That was uh, the reign of uh, uh, Sri uh, Harsha uh, Shiladitya, while of course uh, Farsian beginning of fifth century uh, was there uh, when the Gupta Empire was still full uh, functioning. So again, you have pictures of uh, Farsian of the early uh, traveler here, uh, looking at the ruins of Papaliputra that's taken from a universal history uh, that was published uh, at the beginning of the 20th century in, uh, in the uh, Hutchinson's Story of the Nations in uh, London. Um, so that's colonial, if you like. And this is, of course, uh, if you know a little bit about Indian uh, Buddhist uh, architecture, you can see this is not Pataliputra. This is uh, partly taken from uh, Sanchi or Barhut, I guess. That's where he gets the motives from. But anyway, and uh, even Fashian got his own version in the um, uh, Amar Chitra Kata. Uh, the real Fashian probably didn't look like the one we saw before. Uh, this is a recently, a couple of years ago, discovered um, picture from the Dingling Si in China, in Gansu, in Western China, where uh, they discovered uh, uh, on a wall painting this figure here, looking quite foreign in Chinese terms, uh, which has in the cartouche clearly the indication that this is how people thought Fashin would look like. That's his travel route. Uh, and in comparison with Xuanzang, uh, Fa Xian uh, started from the same <clears throat> starting point, 
the Chinese capital in Chang'an also more or less uh, went the same kind of overland route into India, but then differing, differing from Xuanzang returned via the sea route back to China. So he made a full circle, if you like. Uh, the other one who is uh, later, so we have three, so it's normally a triad of, uh, of famous uh, Buddhist Chinese travelers uh, to India. Uh, Fashin the first, Xuanzang the second, and probably most important, and then Yijing, uh, who was a successor, if you like, of Xuanzang, uh, who traveled seven, uh, 675 to 695. Uh, and who did all his traveling via the sea route. So he started in China again, traveled uh, into uh, Sri Vijaya, Southeast Asia, then to the Bengal coast, then also traveled to central India, what you called in, in Buddhist terms, so Magadha again. Uh, Xuanzang and I Ching both studied and stayed most time of their stay in India at Nalanda, Mahavihara. The translation history of these texts uh, is quite important because uh, it uh, coincides with uh, the start of uh, colonial archaeology, or let's say the kind of professionalization of colonial archaeology uh, archaeology in South Asia. Um, so the text, as you will <coughs> see, as you can see, and if you have a, a slight idea how uh, um, British archaeology in India developed, you can see how the uh, the coincidence actually works. Uh, the texts were translated uh, uh, from the second half, from the first half of the 19th century. And the earliest actually was not Xuanzang's text, not the record of the Western regions, but uh, Fa Xian's much shorter text, probably because it was shorter and uh, more handable uh, than the other. Uh, the first translation of such a so called uh, pilgrimage text was done by uh, the French first holder of uh, Sinology of Chinese Studies at the University of, uh, of Paris, uh, the French Abel Remisa in 1848. And this was a breakthrough because for the first time, actually, uh, you had a historical text that described Buddhist India. Although it was very short, very brief, but uh, it was a first step in the right direction followed by then uh, a turn to uh, Xuanzang's texts. You have to imagine that at that time, it was very difficult actually for Westerners to get uh, uh, in the Chinese texts. They had to ask people uh, working in China, Europeans working in China to get them the texts. So it's not as easy as uh, I can work nowadays, just opening a computer and having a full-fledged electronic version of the complete Chinese Buddhist canon. So uh, Stanislas Julien, the mm, successor on the uh, Chinese studies chair uh, in Paris, uh, did then the translations of all these two uh, texts about Xuanzang. So the first one being 1853, uh, the biography. So that was the first text uh, about Xuanzang that was translated. Very briefly afterwards followed by the same translator uh, with a full-fledged translation of the uh, uh, record of Xuanzang's record. Uh, we still then have to wait quite a while uh, in the 19th century uh, until an English translation is published uh, by Samuel Beale uh, in 1884, which is more or less mm, uh, sometimes uh, even a non-improvement of uh, Julien's French translation, but is the mostly used uh, translation nowadays. So I would warn you, um, this text is not very reliable. And this is also the reason that I actually uh, I took the pain to translate and contextualize, uh, write a commentary on the text. Um, so some follow-ups, Samuel Beale, The Life of Xuanzang, so the biography. Uh, 1904, 1905, Thomas Waters, another British sinologist uh, with a commentary, not a translation as it's very often called, a commentary on the record. And then I would, re I would really uh, recommend you to use these two translations when you're working with them without having access to the Chinese text. 1995, finally, uh, uh, a quite good translation without commentary, which makes it difficult uh, sometimes to contextualize by Li Rongxi, uh, the um, uh, biography, and a year later, the Great Tang Record. So that's uh, Xuanzang's autograph uh, translated into English. 
and very easily accessible because you can download the translations from the web page um, of uh, the publisher. <clears throat> now, this, these translations actually, um, if you like, um, were a turn uh, in uh, the study of Buddhism because they, as I said already, in the context of Farshian's uh, 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 text translation, uh, these, these translations actually opened a window uh, on historical, on me early medieval India, on uh, the Buddhist history mainly, which was missing from the Indian side so far, and which was very welcomed by uh, uh, European um, Indian studies uh, scholars, by so-called Indologists. Christian Lassen, the uh, first shareholder of um, Sanskrit studies at the University of Bonn in, in Germany, just around the corner from here, where I am at the moment, actually uh, had a very, uh, good impression of uh, the translation. So he says in his uh, Indische Altertumskunde, Indian uh, Antiquarian um, Studies, uh, 1874, that's the second edition. Uh, the first one was somewhere in the, in the, in the 50s uh, of, of the 19th century, where you find the same, <clears throat> the same one, where it says, unequally more qualified than the Greek sources. Remember that Alexander uh, almost uh, conquered India. And of course we had, we have uh, Greek sources from an early period about the Mauryan period. Uh, Megasthenes will come uh, into the picture a little bit later. So uh, he compares, Lassen compares the Chinese sources uh, with the Greek here. And equally more qualified than the Greek sources to write authentic reports about India were the Chinese Buddhists who visited the home country of the founder of their religion and the sites sanctified by his deeds, who collected the sacred scriptures of their creed and wrote down their observations after their return to their home country. Xuanzang's report is a pleasant contrast to the quality of the Indian sources, which are restricted to give dry facts like the succession of rulers, sacrifices, donations of land, and general statements about victories and eulogies on the rulers. And, and now I can't actually really read what is on the slide because, yeah, now it's uh, on the rulers and uh, there, what? Uh, well, you probably can read it. I can't read it. And so very. <laughs> Thank you. So a very, um, a, a very positive uh, response to the, uh, to the translation of the text, which was picked up by uh, this guy, uh, whom you certainly all know, Alexander Cunningham, uh, the father, if you like, of the archaeological survey uh, of India. Uh, he was the first director, uh, as you probably know. You see him here once with some of his collected goods on the right-hand side and on the left-hand side with some of his collaborators. He actually um, had a very high opinion of Xuanzang. He actually used first the French translation, later uh, with Beale's English translation, also the English translation, to more or less uh, identify most of the places described in Xuanzang's text on the ground uh, in, in India. And this is what he has to say about, uh, about, the, um, uh, about, the, uh, about the quality of the text, of the source. Uh, this is actually, this was handed in when he applied uh, for the construction, uh, for the setup of the archeological survey of India uh, to, the, uh, to, the, to the Viceroy. Uh, he says, in describing the ancient geography of India, the elder Pliny, for the sake of clearness, follows the footsteps of Alexander the Great. So here again, we have the references to the Greeks. For a similar reason, in the present proposed investigation, that is the archaeological exploration of northern India, I, Cunningham, would follow the footsteps of the Chinese pilgrim Xuanzang, who in the seventh century of our era traversed India from west to east and back again for the purpose of visiting all the famous sites of Buddhist history and tradition. In the account of his travels, although the Buddhist remains are described in most detail with all their attendant legends and traditions, yet the number and appearance of the Brahmanical temples are also noted and the travels of the Chinese pilgrims thus hold the place in the history of India, which those of Pausanias uh, holds in the history of Greek. So the last sentence, of course, is a captatio benevolentia. If you go to Xuanzang's text, there is not much description of Brahminical and as a fact of other religious uh, 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 remains. But this was needed, of course, to attract the attention of the Viceroy and a European public. 
Now, this is a map which uh, you can find in Cunningham's geography, um, published in 1871, where he clearly follows uh, all the different places and sites which are described in Xuanzang's uh, record. And the region we are interested in today is just here on the right bottom, uh, Magadha. And you can see probably here the Ganga. You can see Nalanda. You can see uh, somewhere is Rad. There's Bodhgaya and uh, Rajgir is up here. Patna or Pataliputra here. So uh, after introducing the text, now introducing the Xuanzang Trail Project. I was lucky enough <laughs> to encounter uh, uh, now very dear a friend and colleague, uh, Dr. Vijay Kumar uh, Chaudhary, uh, who at that time when we met, I think was still uh, ex uh, director of the KP Jayaswal Research Institute in Patna, uh, who actually suggested to me uh, to, uh, well, to uh, make, to have a, a common project, uh, which we then called the Xuanzang Trail Project which uh, had as aims, and we'll come uh, uh, to this in some detail a little bit later, uh, of course, to <coughs> trace uh, Xuanzang's trail in a very specific region in India, uh, in Bihar, that is in Magadha. This then was uh, funded and supported finally by the Bihar Heritage Development Society, still is funded in Patna, of which uh, uh, Dr. Chaudhary is now the ex uh, executive director. So we both are the principal investigators and were fortunate enough, and that's mostly uh, uh, Dr. Chaudhary is doing, uh, a, a team of collaborators. We have on board Dr. Uh, Rajani from the National Institute of Advanced Studies in Bangalore, who is dealing with uh, satellite archeology span and related matters. We have Professor Javed Malik of the IIT Kanpur, who is our scientist in the sense that he is doing, for instance, <coughs> ground penetrating radar, which of course is quite important if you want to um, discover sites without digging. And we also have on board Dr. Abhishek Amar Singh uh, from uh, Hamilton College, who actually uh, is, um, well, who, who, who knows the region, uh, Bihar, like my uh, other collaborator, Dr. Chaudhuri, um, uh, well, like, as, as I know my, my, my hometown probably. So a very good team. Uh, part of the team is seen here uh, <clears throat> on the occasion of our first field meeting or our first field trip uh, in January, 2020 in the beautiful new Patna Museum. Uh, so some of uh, the people you see here are uh, colleagues from me from, uh, from Cardiff, Dr. Richard Madwick, um, uh, who is an archaeology, an archaeologist, <coughs> and an art historian from Cardiff, uh, Dr. Lakshmi Greaves. Um, now, the aims of the project is to explore the archaeology of Buddhism in Bihar on the basis of textual and material evidence. And it is clear that, of course, that Xuanzang here is one of the main driving forces uh, when we want to uh, look for and to identify uh, sites in Bihar. The aim is also to verify, to falsify, to identify, if new, uh, and map and explore, and in a few cases, even excavate sites described by Xuanzang. And you see, I've already again marked it uh, with uh, inverted commas, uh, the description part, because of course, uh, contextualization shows <clears throat> that description uh, is only partly a correct uh, um, a term for what Xuanzang really does in the text. The methodology is, and I've uh, brought that home already several times now, contextualize, contextualize, contextualize. No, seriously. Uh, it is multidisciplinary. It is bringing together philological and textual studies uh, from the standpoint of Buddhist studies, and that's more or less uh, my task in the project. It's bringing together history, which is probably the link between uh, the philological and textual studies and the rest of it. It's bringing together, it bringing in also field archaeology, satellite archaeology, scientific methods like uh, ground penetrating ra uh, radar. My colleague from Cardiff, Richard Madwick, for instance, is a specialist for bones. So if we encounter bones, he's the right person actually to uh, have a look. 
My own methodology and principles, mostly working with the texts, is to deliver a sound and transparent uh, translation accompanied by critically edited Chinese text. So this is, I think, important because in a lot of cases, when you read the translations as a non-Chinese reader, you probably uh, will get maybe a wrong impression. A lot of uh, translators, most of the translators actually translate the text as if it is an, as I said, autograph, so a, an I who speaks. So I Xuanzang went from here to there. The Chinese text doesn't have that. And I think that in a translation, you have to mark that. You can't translate the pronoun I when it's not there in the Chinese text. There should also be a philological apparatus uh, explaining why I translate what I translate. Then, of course, now here comes in contextualization again, check the historical, geographical, and textual context. So whatever sources are there for a certain site, for a certain place, for a certain uh, observation in the text, try to collect all the material and contextualize. So in, uh, in the end, what I do is I give a translation, but the translation very often is the smallest part. I also give an introductory chapter to each section in which all the already mentioned available information, textual, historical, geographical, archaeological, art historical, et cetera, et cetera, about a region, the topic, a narrative that he often uh, relates is made available to the reader in a way that he actually can follow me how I actually did my contextualization. Then <clears throat> contextualize the text and investigate its underlying intentionalities. So uh, the question I'm normally asking my students, ask the, the, the W questions, why, where, who, etc. Why is a certain information given in the text, or sometimes even not given where you would expect it? Why is it given in a specific, in a particular way? So the principle here is the author wants to achieve something, wants to influence his readership. Remember, this text was written the autograph was written, the record was written for the Tang Emperor. So Xuanzang had the opportunity actually to influence the emperor. So this is as first step more important. The next step then can be to look what is lying behind the description, what is the historical uh, the basis of what Xuanzang describes or not. So we zoom back into the region uh, uh, I want to deal with. The map of the place is linked to the life of the Buddha in Northern India. And you see here, it's a little bit uh, bigger the map, but this is the area we are working in, in the project. So uh, uh, Magadha or Bihar, mostly south of the Ganga, but also later on, we probably will look at uh, parts of uh, north of the Ganga. Where, of course, I could have chosen now as examples <coughs> the most famous Buddhist sites. I could have chosen Raja Griha with the Grita Kuta, the, the vulture peak on which uh, the, um, uh, the Buddha delivered uh, a lot of his sermons um, allegedly. I could have chosen, of course, even more important and famous Bodhgaya here in the 19th century um, uh, picture, the, the Mahabodhi temple, the big one. Uh, particularly because, of course, there's the continuity of Chinese interest in Bodh Gaya. Now, we, we, we have from Bodh Gaya a couple of uh, Chinese inscriptions later than Xuanzang that prove that Bodh Gaya, in so far also Magadha as a whole, but Bodh Gaya, uh, Bodh Gaya in particular, was a place of interest for uh, Chinese up into the 12th, 13th century, because that's uh, the, the, the time uh, from where some of these, uh, uh, of these inscriptions come from. Quite large, as you can see, so they give quite a lot of information, but that's for another talk. Now, uh, this is a map, uh, a Google map, uh, which shows you the um, sites which the team visited last year in January. So when I was there, uh, and the photo you saw earlier showed the, the group more or less, <laughs> uh, this is what we did. We looked uh, particularly, and you see a lot, a lot of uh, yellow needles here uh, around Patna, Pataliputra. We looked at Pataliputra in some detail. We looked at uh, Telhara, the old monastery of Thailadaka, yeah. and then uh, traced uh, Xuanzang's record uh, on his way down to Gaya and Bodh Gaya. And you see another needle here, a uh, big mountain, stone stupa, Kawadol, uh, and so what I've chosen for today is a case study of Patna, of Pataliputra, 
end of this minor site, if you like, it's much smaller, of course, than the big city, uh, the big mountain stone described by Xuanzang uh, as the final one. So Pataliputra, Patna. And I'm not claiming that Patna and Pataliputra are exactly the same uh, as uh, you probably would expect from a more critical approach. So this is probably what uh, you uh, uh, mostly see when you go to the internet and put in Pataliputra. You will give you will give a uh, you will get a picture of the famous and beautiful Yakshi from Pataliputra. Uh, you may also find, if you are looking for um, the older stratum of archaeology done in the region, uh, colonial archaeology, uh, pictures like this, because Pataliputra is, uh, as an archaeological site, famous for having uh, delivered insights into the fortifications of a city, of a very old uh, Indian city, in form of wooden palisades, uh, so an old excavation photo here. And this is what Xuanzang tells us about Pataliputra. <clears throat> he says, he starts his description uh, uh, with, to the south of the river Ganga is an ancient city with a circumference of more than 70 miles. And miles are always Chinese miles of about 4.2, 4.3 kilometers, uh, uh, I'm sorry, 420, 430 uh, meters. That's a Chinese mile. Uh, still a big city, obviously. Although it is already desolated for a long time, its remains are still there. Formerly, when the lifespan of men was still immeasurable, it was called the city of Jisu Mo Bolo. So I, pr pr I pronounce it in the Chinese uh, uh, um, uh, in order to give you an impression how this would uh, sound to a modern Chinese ear when he reads. In the royal palace, there were many flowers, and that is how it received its name. When, alas, the lifespan of men reached only several thousand years, the name was changed to Bota Lizi, formerly called the settlement of Balianzi, which is incorrect. So what he gives here is a short description of Pataliputra. He gives two names, as you see. One is this Chisu, uh, Chisu Mo Bulo, which is, if you go here, and I've given you uh, uh, my so-called philological apparatus to this passage. Everything's all right? Can I continue? Anchet, mute yourself. Anchet, mute yourself. <laughs> Okay, so if, if you actually look at the uh, reconstructed, so linguistically reconstructed Chinese of, let's say, the, the, the 7th or 8th century, this comes very close to what the Sanskrit really uh, is, the underlying Sanskrit. So, Chusu Mo Bulo, believe me or not, is Kusumapura. So, Kusuma uh, Polo, something like that, uh, uh, pronounced in Chinese of that time. So he gives the other name, Pataliputra, as second. Pateli and then uh, Putra, son, is given in, uh, in, its Chinese, uh, uh, in its Chinese character, in its Chinese meaning. So it's a hybrid uh, translation, transliteration of the name Pataliputra. And then he also gives very often, and this is why I show it to you, how, how the text actually is, is structured, <clears throat> very often gives after introducing his new uh, rendering of the Indian name, the older form which you find in older Chinese translations, which uh, is here in the footnote three. I spare you with this. Now, contextualizing. Uh, to do this, uh, that was very short, and remember the most important parts. Uh, the city is south of the river Ganga. It is an ancient city. It is desolated. And that's pretty much what we get. The biography says about Xuanzang's stay, the Dharma master spent seven days in the small city. So there was obviously a small city outside of the ancient city in order to go and to venerate the sacred traces. So only seven days he was there. Now the young, uh, the older uh, pilgrim, the older traveler, Fashian, has a relatively long description of uh, Pataliputra. And the reason for that is that Fashian stayed in Pataliputra for two years to study uh, uh, Buddhist texts uh, and to collect Buddhist texts to bring them back to China and, and to translate them. So he had quite a good knowledge of the city as it was uh, in the Gupta period. So he describes it partly at least as follows. 
after crossing the river Ganga and going downstream in southern direction, so we're on the south side of the Ganga, uh, over the distance of one Yojana, one arrives in Magadha, in the city of Pataliputra. It is Pataliputra where King Ashoka has ruled. The royal palace in the city has been built by ghosts who piled up stones to build walls and watchtowers, chiseled out characters, graved inlay, uh, inlays, which cannot be reduce, uh, reduced, uh, produced in this world. And then he goes into a description of Pataliputra with uh, a flourishing community of Buddhist monasteries. Uh, so he gives us a much more vivid description uh, than Xuanzang does, which is understandable because at that time, obviously, Pataliputra was still a vibrant uh, capital of uh, the Gupta uh, of the Gupta period, while at the time of Xuanzang, uh, the capital of uh, Sri Harsha's um, uh, empire, of course, was Kanauj or Kanyakubja. <clears throat> so um, Ashoka was mentioned by Fasien, is also mentioned in Xuanzang's uh, uh, description, but uh, 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 so Pataliputra definitely uh, dif differs from other uh, Buddhist sites because the Buddha really was not uh, active there much at least. He passed through at some point when Pataliputra was actually built up as a capital of, uh, of the Magadan Empire, but uh, there are no real stories uh, of the Buddha having stayed uh, and uh, been active at Pataliputra. So everything is, when you read the description, um, around Ashoka which also uh, clearly is uh, attested by the uh, by an Ashokan pillar at Kumraha in, uh, in Patna. So we have traces uh, of Mauryan um, origin uh, on the site, which uh, shows that some of uh, what the pilgrims actually describe is certainly based on reality. So contextualization again, the names of the city. Remember, Xuanzang gave, gave us two names. He said, in older times, in ancient times, uh, projects it back in the very, very distant past. Uh, the city was called Kusumapura. Now, Kusumapura is indeed the name which, for instance, a Pali source in the 10th century, the Mahabodhi Vamsa, uses for Pataliputra. The deeper Vamsa in the Mahavamsa, the Sri Lankan chronicles, the Pali chronicles, call the city Puppapura, which would be <clears throat> Sanskrit, Pushpapura, the city of flowers. Very close, but not exactly the same. In Vishaka Datta's Mudra Rakshasa, uh, Rakshasa so a, a drama, uh, uh, the both names are actually used. Uh, so Pataliputra is called Kusumapura, but it's also called Pataliputra in its perfect form, Bada Leyuta. Uh, another text which give, gives both, both names is the Jain text Tipogali, which I will deal uh, with in a moment, uh, where uh, the city is called Badaliputta, again, Prakrit, uh, or Kusuma Nagara. The Manchu Sri Mula Kalpa, a relatively late Buddhist text in its uh, 53rd chapter, which is a kind of short history of Buddhism in India, uh, calls the city Kusuma Ahvanagara, so the Kusuma city, yeah? uh, or it call, but it also calls it the Patala city, which is Pataliputra. And also Pushpa Akya Nagara, so the Pushpa Pura. So all three names that we had in other Indian texts are actually um, uh, there in the Manjushri Mula Kalpa, which leads to the conclusion that both names, as Xuanzang also says, were still in use in the second half of the first millennium AD. <clears throat> now, this is uh, a reconstruction of Pataliputra, uh, which uh, with some of the major sites on the uh, lower map. So this is following uh, Professor Schlingloff's reconstruction according to the Greek description, which we will see in a moment, where it says that the city of Pataliputra is, uh, has a tra trapezoid shape. So you can see that here. And that uh, the southern side and the eastern side are actually um, built along the river Eranoboas, which is the Shon, uh, and the Ganga. So this is the old uh, description. Below you have the reconstruction according to the archeological sites with the Ganga flowing uh, where it is now. We'll look into this in a moment. So um, what we have seen here is that the Greek authors actually position Patna or Pataliputra north of the river Shon. Now, if you go to uh, Patna today, there is no river Shon anymore. So obviously the Shon has 
moved, we can assume. That the Shona actually, the Shona uh, River actually was uh, adjacent to the uh, to the city of Pataliputra is very well confirmed by Indian texts. So we have, for instance, Patanjali Mahapasya uh, to Panini to one sixteen, <coughs> where it is said that Patali lies along the Shona. No Ganga is mentioned, uh, but the Shona. Uh, and a Buddhist text, uh, a later text, the Apisama Charika Dharma, a Mahasangika text uh, of uh, Vinaya content also refers uh, to rivers uh, uh, related to cities. And again, we find here uh, Pataliputre Sunapaniya. So the waters of the Shona at Pataliputra, no Ganga. This is also confirmed by the already mentioned uh, play or drama uh, Mudra Rakshasa, fourth, fifth century roughly, <coughs> where uh, an attack on uh, Pataliputra is described. And the king actually describes the attack with his elephants drinking water from the river Shona. So all these references show that the Shon or the Shona at the time, let's say up to the fourth, fifth century was adjacent to uh, the city of Pataliputra. This is also confirmed by the Greek authors, Megasthenes, uh, in one of his fragments actually describes the city as it was constructed on the map we saw before, uh, where he actually says that uh, Pataliputra uh, is lying at the uh, confluent of uh, the Eranaboas, which probably is Sanskrit Hiranyavaha or Hiranyabahu, and a uh, name that is what most uh, scholars actually assume, the name of the Shona and the Ganges, the Ganga. Yeah, so that was exactly the map as we saw it before. Strabo in the first century AD just echoes what uh, Megasthenes says, but uh, gives the, um, uh, the, the information that the shape of the city was a, par parallel, a parallelogram. Now, <clears throat> the historical importance of the changes of the riverbeds of the Ganga and the Shona. So the assumption uh, I've already mentioned that the riverbeds of both rivers changed. The Ganga moving south, where it is now, and the Shona actually moving west, where it is now mouthing into the, into the Ganga in our days. Now the conclusion is that the ancient city was further to the south of the Ganga as it is now. Now, when you look at Patna, it is adjacent to the, um, uh, uh, at the north uh, to the river Ganga. In, in older times, obviously, the Ganga was further up north. The questions then are, are when did, did these shifts happen and what effect did it have on the historical situation of the city? And the answer may come from a uh, rather unknown giant sources, which you've already encountered, the Shvetambara uh, text, Titogali Painayam, from the fifth, sixth century. This is the uh, translation of the whole passage, which I cannot read out because of uh, time restraints, but uh, you can detect probably when you skip over it, that it is dealing with a huge flood, a disastrous flood that has hit uh, Pataliputra when the Ganga and the Shona actually uh, rose and completely swept away the city. It also tells us why this is, of course, in a, in a typical kar karmic, context it is because one uh, one of the kings a king called chaturmuka so the four-faced <coughs> actually was very bad a very evil king full of pride uh, and did not support remember this is a giant text the giants and this of course is uh, the um, uh, is uh, is well he's punished for it it also says the text that the city afterwards is reconstructed now Paul Dundas, a specialist, a British specialist of uh, Jain studies, has shown quite convincingly that this King Chaturmuka, the four-faced, who is called also Dushta Budi, the ill-minded, uh, when he still is a prince, refers in more general terms not to a specific Gupta king, but to the uh, rule of the Gupta dynasty as such. So the possible historical interpretation then is that the deluge, the flooding of Pataliputra may have happened at some time between the earlier Chinese pilgrims uh, or travelers far staying in Pataliputra between 4.7 and 4.8, uh, 
when the Gupta city was still intact as a capital, and the probable uh, removal or shift of the Gupta capital, uh, which we know from uh, other sources, from Pataliputra to Ayodhya during the later reign of Kumara Gupta I or Skanda Gupta, that is between 415 and 467. They both were stern Vaishnavas, according to their own official documents, so that would fit the Jain source quite well, right? Because the king, of course, there is a heretic. He's evil because he's uh, not supporting the Jains. The date may still be narrowed through the Udayagiri inscription dated to the year 436 uh, and reflecting the support of Jainism by Kumara Gupta's brother Rama Gupta. So here we have a king who supported the Jains. <clears throat> so in, at some point, probably in that time window, uh, this terrible flooding happened, which more or less did away with the old Pataliputra. So the conclusion then would be, reading it back into the Chinese uh, uh, records, that Fa Xian, the earlier traveler, experienced a city which was identical which, uh, with what Xuanzang himself calls the small town, that town where he stayed for seven days when he was there. And the conclusion from that may be, and I'll talk about that a little bit later uh, uh, in more details, that at the time when Xuanzang was there, there may have been two Pataliputras, the old ancient city, which was given up, which was uh, already desolated, and a smaller city, which probably was still inhabited uh, in some way. And of course, then the question would be archeological, where is this? Now, here I give you uh, very quickly, um, because what we had before was a very small text about uh, the position of Pataliputra south of the Ganga. Of course, what Xuanzang has is a full-fledged description in Buddhist terms of the city, uh, actually mentioning all the different places which you find, for instance, in the Ashoka biography, in the Ashoka Avadana, uh, all the, the big deeds that Ashoka did in Pataliputra are described uh, in details. And of course, we are also given directions as normally in these pilgrim records. So for instance, to the north of the ancient royal palace is a stone pillar several tens of feet high, which marks the place where King No Sorrow, that is Ashoka, had built a hell, which is the, the prison, the famous prison of the Ashoka legend. In the hundredth year after the Nirvana of the Tathagata Shakyamuni, there was the King Ashutya Ashoka, the great grandson of King uh, Bimbisara, who transferred the capital from the city of royal residence to Pataliputra, rebuilt the outer city wall and encircled the old city with it but after such a long period of time, there are only ancient fundaments left. So this is the only part I read out, but it also shows you, it already shows you the problem with some of the descriptions. For instance, Ashoka is not the great grandson of uh, Bimbisara. Yeah? He is at best uh, the, uh, the son of Bindusara. So uh, something is wrong here in, in, in Xuanzang's um, description. Then you have a lot of descriptions of stupas of monasteries in the city, which of course you can try to locate and Cunningham actually has done that when he looked uh, in Pataliputra and uh, some of his uh, successors, archaeologists like Waddle, um, etc. Spooner have tried to do the same uh, without much success because uh, the description is to be honest and to be short uh, a mess, you have to contextualize really very hard to, um, uh, to make sense of this. So you see, this is much longer, and all the dots actually are long stories uh, taken from the Buddhist uh, narratives. <clears throat> so I spare you this. Um, now, contextualizing this uh, with the work uh, we are doing uh, on the project. So this uh, is a map we, which we created after our first um, and unfortunately only meeting uh, in Patna uh, last year in January, where we visited several places uh, and had a look uh, at the text, at Xuanzang's text in my translation and with my commentary and tried to make sense of earlier archeological descriptions and of the description in uh, the pilgrim, uh, in the travelogue. Now we started uh, at a place called Pikna Pahadi, so that's an, an elevation, uh, as you can see, uh, in, uh, north, in the northwest of modern Patna, near the river Ganga, very close uh, to Patna College, um, which was identified by, um, I think it was uh, Cunningham, 
with and uh, some of his followers as well with uh, the uh, big monastery which King Ashoka uh, erected for his uh, brother who had become a monk because of the peak now obviously so the beggars uh, uh, mountain uh, this was the, the kind of uh, uh, connection that was made <clears throat> This creates, if you take this as a fixed point uh, for everything that follows in the description of Xuanzang, this creates a mess. So there are other places, of course, in Patna, which were excavated, the most famous one probably being here, where the map says Arogya Vihara, which is the famous uh, so-called pillar hall, the Mauryan pillar hall, excavated, now where's the cursor? Here, and a monastery from, uh, from the uh, Gupta period excavated as well. Uh, we started our um, uh, um, our um, kind of exploration, uh, well, uh, informed by Vijay uh, uh, Choudhury, um, with two mounds. Now, uh, where's the cursor, please? Called Mansu Mazar, uh, uh, and uh, well, let's see where it is. And where is the? Oh no, here Mansu Mazar here, and. Mengdi Masar, Mengdi Masar here, which is on the southern side of the railway line uh, crossing through Patna. Uh, these are mounds. I unfortunately don't have photos of the mounds because uh, my, my card is in the camera in my Cardiff office and I, I didn't have access to my Cardiff office since last March. Otherwise, I could have shown you some of uh, the pictures. <laughs> mounds, which clearly um, have, they have uh, Sufi tombs on top of it. But they clearly show, even if you go and you start kind of scrapping at the side, you, you can find old remains. So this actually would be places which definitely should be uh, examined by, for instance, ground penetrating radar to see what is underneath. Then we went uh, to what was the old Mughal Western Gate and Eastern Gate uh, of uh, the city of Patna. And we also visited a uh, a, a pillar stump uh, that is positioned here uh, near the dead arm of the Ganga, um, where we suspected this could be Ashokan, but this, this has to be uh, verified. So what this whole map means is we give up Pigna Pahari as a fixed point uh, to um, lo localize the old Pataliputra. We also give up the Mauryan Pillar Hall and this Arokya Vihara as a fixed point, and instead concentrate on these places as fixed points. And you can already see if you link those needles, you get the shape, roughly the shape which uh, is uh, reconstructed on the basis of the Greek, very old uh, descriptions of the city. So there is uh, a working uh, uh, hypothesis that this is the territory of the old Pataliputra, not here, but rather here. But this, of course, has to be verified. This would also mean, of course, that the river Shona, the Shon, actually mouths into the Ganga somewhere, uh, somewhere here, because the Ganga was further up north. Yeah. Now it's it's here on on that side. This also this whole new positioning of uh, of the possible archaeological site of the city of Pata, of the ancient city of Pataliputra, is much better um, in sync with uh, the finding place of the famous Didar Ganj Yakshi, the picture I've shown you, which is now in the Patna Museum at the beginning, which was found uh, around here. So we move the whole city uh, to uh, the east, and then. We can actually look uh, into Xuanzang's description again, where he describes that uh, north to the uh, to the sorry to the southwest of uh, uh, the ancient city, there is uh, there are five uh, stupas stupa mounds that are already uh, dilapidated, and we have indeed, I think I have a picture here, here south uh, southwest. Where's the curse? Southwest. It doesn't, it doesn't move across the map, but you can see southwest from our new old Pataliputra, more or less southwest, we have a couple of mounds, uh, 
at least five, uh, probably more, uh, which fit very well to the description of Xuanzang. So kind of relocating the whole, the whole setting of the city gives us a new insight or a new approach to the other sites described in Xuanzang's report, which didn't make sense before at all. Um, so much about Pataliputra, I could go on, as I said, but now very briefly uh, on the second side, we are talking about, we are leaving Pataliputra, that's what we did, we, uh, we drove down to Telhara, to uh, the monast monastic uh, excavation site of Kailadaka uh, Monastery, and then uh, went on uh, our way to the Barabar Hills uh, around here. Uh, and I particularly had in mind finding a mountain that is described by Xuanzang in that area, must have been in that area, um, which is described as follows. More than 90 miles southwest of Paladaka, Telhara Monastery, on a rise at a big mountain with one rock next to the other reaching up to the clouds where spirits and immortals reside. Poisonous snakes and violent nagas gather in its caves. Fierce beasts, beasts and birds of prey dwell in its forests. On the crest of the mountain is a huge boulder, and on top of it is a stupa, more than 10 feet high and marking the place where the Buddha entered contemplation. Formerly, when the Tathagata had subdued a local spirit, Shen, and then stayed there, he was sitting on this boulder, entered into the contemplation of extinction, <clears throat> and at that time he spent the night there. All the gods and divine immortals made offerings to the Tathagata, played celestial music, and had celestial flowers rain down. <clears throat> when the Tathagata emerged from contemplation, all the gods felt grateful and built a stupa from jewels, gold, and silver. Now that the lifetime of the saint of the Buddha is already so far, the jewels have turned into stone. Since ancient time until today, it is only when one looks at the high mountain from the distance that one sees the strange creatures. Together, like close relatives, huge snakes and fierce beasts circumambulate the stupa clockwise. Celestial immortals and divine saints come, follow each other according, uh, and so on and so forth. I can read that uh, with, uh, and pay reverence, uh, reverence should be with a B, of course, uh, to the stupa. So I was, I was actually expecting this, uh, this mountain and this stupa to be found uh, in the area of the Barabar Hills directly. And this is also where Cunningham actually located it. Uh, when we actually drove back from the Barabar Hills towards Patna uh, in last January, uh, we approached a mountain, as you see it right now, uh, the sun already setting, which was just not only stunning because of the landscape, but of course immediately struck me by this shape. Now, it looks like exactly what Xuanzang describes. Uh, when you approach the mountain, again, I don't have pictures of the mountains I took. Uh, they are, uh, the mountain is, or the hill is, consisting of huge rock boulders that are piled uh, on top of each other. And on the top, you have this very specific um, rock formation or rock, which looks like a stupa. Not only from the distance like here, but when we got closer, it still looked like that. So the description is very close, but that's not all. When you arrive at the foot of the mountain, of, uh, of the hill, there are rock images uh, in, uh, incised into the rock uh, of Buddhas and other deities. They are, of course, later than Xuanzang's description, a couple of uh, decades, probably centuries later, but they still clearly show the importance <coughs> of the mountain, and they're only found at the foot. So obviously nobody, nobody really developed the top of the mountain. It was left untouched. But on top of these rock images, you also found, now enshrined by the Archaeological Survey of India for protection, uh, a, man, a man high uh, Buddha statue, beautifully done uh, of Pala uh, origin, of course, 8th, 9th century, which again clearly shows that this mountain, at least the foot of the mountain, was... Uh, um, at some point, a very important pilgrimage site. And for me, this actually is without doubt uh, the place that Xuanzang describes. So we have identified, and that's the, um, uh, that's the important part of it, we have identified another place from which we can actually start calculating uh, the uh, 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 description of Xuanzang, which he gives, 
uh, on his way uh, to Bodh Gaya and start rethinking, recalibrating, if you like, uh, the whole Xuanzang trail. And with this, I think I should stop. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Deek, uh, for that uh, wonderful presentation and contextualization, which is something that we also keep trying to din into the heads of our students that how important it is to contextualize, uh, you know, all kinds of material that you get, whether it's textual or visual. So that's fantastic. Um, I will uh, ask the seminar committee to please, uh, 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 you know, uh, you know, read out questions or uh, ask questions. If you're in the meeting, you can unmute yourself and ask questions. So I think uh, Ashu, Priya, Avijit, if you can take over from here. Yeah, yes ma'am. Thank you. So thank you so much for the wonderful lecture. So sir, there is one question from Shailendra Raj Mehta is asking, uh, Professor Deek, you mentioned that while Shangyang is mostly reliable, sometimes he is not. Where, where, in your opinion, is he most wrong? What uh, could we have to revise any anything major in the light of these errors? Um. Okay, so I'm a little bit hesitant to talk. If I did this, I have to apologize. Uh, I, 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 I don't like the term, uh, the terms mistake or error, although I may use them uh, colloquially uh, every once in a while. So uh, I think uh, what we need to do is to look at Xuanzang's uh, record case by case and really uh, again contextualization uh, contextualization comes uh, comes into play again and then uh, see what uh, other information other, other sets of information can contribute to the interpretation of uh, a certain Xuanzang passage so my my whole approach is actually the other way around if you like i'm not actually looking at something and say well mm, that's probably wrong uh, that description is not really a description that, that something is wrong here with let's say the direction or the, the location or the he tells a story that doesn't make sense in a specific context uh, my question is rather the other way around asking well why is it possibly so that he um, describes inverted commas something in a specific context in a particular way um, and not in the way I expect it to be described, right? Because I have information from somewhere else. Uh, let's say uh, the location should be somewhere else. And I think, oh, it doesn't, doesn't really work. Come on, the, the guy has completely missed, missed his point. Yeah? No, the other way around, uh, you ask actually, why is he possibly claiming things in his text which are not in accordance with um, another set of information? And very often, actually, you, you can find out, if you know the guy, if you know the text, if you know the context, you can find out or you can give an explanation why a certain description, why a certain uh, information is given, which does not fit to another um, uh, point of information. So it's not an error as such, uh, in the sense of, I don't care, I just write something down, or in the sense of, oh no, I don't remember really, I just, just lie to them. It's fine. They will not. They will not know. Yeah, you certainly didn't expect Cunningham to run around and look for these places and say, "Yeah, oh, something's wrong here," or, or me doing something with the text. Um, that's that's certainly not what he had in mind. So it was not. Uh, he, he wanted to give a um, a an accurate as accurate as possible description. Description in inverted commas again. It's of course a mixture of his own. Buddhist baggage he already brought to India in his mind. He knew all these stories, he knew that these places must have been somewhere, right? And his experience. And if the text is in disaccordance with some others, there must be an explanation for it. So I never dismiss a passage or his text as a mistake, an error without really delving into matters and try to at least understand why, why is it given in that way? Why is it explained in that way? In most cases, I can, I can reassure you, and we'll be able to read that at some point in the commentary, hopefully, um, 
there is an explanation. Okay. Thank you, sir. And we have two hands raised. One is from Divakar Singh. Divakar Singh, you want to ask the question? You can. Please unmute yourself and ask. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, uh, thank you, Professor Deeg. Uh, it's been, uh, it's really a fascinating uh, talk. Uh, now, my question is, uh, it's not question, rather one comment, uh, that uh, colonial archaeology, particularly Cunningham's method of archaeology, was largely text-centric. And uh, he followed entirely, you know, uh, the tale of uh, Zhuang Zhang's text. Uh, now, uh, I mean, he made several mistakes as well. Uh, uh, I mean, identifying Bikram Sila with uh, one of the monastery, in, uh, one of the sites in Bihar Sarif. Uh, uh, now, till recent, uh, 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 the, the, the tendency to follow the Zhuang Zhang's text um, has been continued. Uh, don't you think, I mean, there are several minor sites which have been, uh, I mean, like excavated, but has potential to give a new insights uh, in terms of landscape archaeology of Magdha, particularly I'm referring to one very important site called Juafar D. That was, uh, uh, you know, excavated in 2005 and 6. Uh, and uh, it has continued to write from NDP phase to, uh, uh, you know, early modern, uh, uh, sorry, early uh, medieval kind, um, kind of, till 12th century. So my question is, I mean, why we are obsessed with all uh, sort of tech-centric Zhuang Zhang's uh, details? I mean, Zhuang Zhang has a very specific gaze to capture the reality. So he may not, um, and he's not a historian. I mean, he's a monk. He's a primarily a pilgrim. Uh, I mean, considering that, don't you think we need to be a bit critical about his, uh, uh, you know, details and uh, we also need to be very careful about uh, the way uh, we have uh, i mean the archaeology has uh, i mean right from the colonial period to the post colonial period people have uh, followed that the same kind of approach thank you thank you well i fully agree with you um, about cunningham so but it's not shenzang's fault, I would say again, it, it is, uh, in this case, Cunningham's fault. Um, <laughs> so I, I also agree fully with you that, uh, and I hope I have make, made this clear during the talk, but also in my last response, that um, it is indeed important to uh, critically assess the text. And one of the um, uh, kind of bottom-down uh, um, uh, uh, interpretation of the text which first starts with questions like, what is the purpose of this text or what are the purposes? Because I think it has several kind of intentional layers, the text, and which intentional layers plays into a certain passage at a certain uh, specific uh, place in the text, right? So if it describes something, the most obvious uh, intentionality uh, is by the way, uh, in the second chapter where it gives a general description of India. This general description of India is a very interesting mix of um, observations, information uh, gained in India. He could not have gotten that from, from, from a Chinese context, from, from a Chinese text so far. Uh, but at the same time, there are a lot of uh, information given that clearly kind of twists the description into a certain intentional direction. He wants, for instance, in that case, impress the Chinese emperor by describing India as an idealized Buddhist kingdom. And the rule, of course, at that time is Harsha. So Harsha is the ideal Buddhist king, although we know from, from historical sources that, of course, he was not a Buddhist, at least uh, exclusively. So uh, th there is an intentional angle, and that also comes into play when he describes certain places. Uh, for instance, you have descriptions of monasteries uh, which probably not were not really monasteries, but rather smaller monastic communities of which we will never probably find any trace, but it's still described. And of course, Cunningham still has identified them wrongly, falsely. So there we have to be honest and say, well, in some cases, we just can't, can't trace anything. So, uh, and again, uh, if you look into the text, uh, of these passages, very often you, you can find a reason why he's giving it as he does. There are, for instance, a couple of two monasteries between, if I go back, I think you still can see the screen, right? 
Yeah, okay. Yes. yes. Okay. So if I if I go back here, so he he describes, uh, as I said, he has never been to all these places. For instance, he describes somewhere in this region. If we kind of follow the distance and the and the direction, somewhere in this region, he describes a uh, a valley with uh, with cave uh, with, with with caves with ma mountain uh, with with, um, with with monastic caves which probably must have looked stunning, but there is nothing. I mean, nowadays there is nothing. Uh, taking, uh, taking apart, uh, well, uh, apart from the fact that, of course, the Son, which you can, by the way, see here, fl uh, flowing into the Ganga, not here in, uh, in, uh, in the Prataliputra, there's nothing here. Uh, it's just probably never was there. Some, maybe somebody has told him, oh, there are these fascinating uh, cave uh, uh, monasteries there, and no, nothing. A second set of two monasteries actually should be somewhere between Pataliputra and Telhara, um, small monasteries as it describes it. And they are important because obviously um, there are two famous teachers he studied under, uh, which had their whole monasteries exactly there. But again, on the surface, there is nothing. Maybe we'll find something, maybe nothing. Maybe, I mean, it is also the, of course, it opens questions like um, how were monasteries really organized? We know these big, these big monastic sites like, for instance, um, uh, Nalanda yeah? um, uh, and, and, and others. Uh, but uh, we also know that very often monastic communities were very small, 20, 30 monks. And they never really probably lived in brick structures. So well, what is left of these of these so-called monasteries, of these viharas? I mean, they, they speak about viharas. Vihara just means dwelling place. So I fully, I fully uh, uh, subscribe to your points. And I'm very glad actually that uh, this critical reading of Cunningham now really has uh, is taking place. Because I was sometimes frustrated when when I talked to Indian colleagues and then or Indian friends and they said, "Yeah, but Cunningham says." I said, "Well, Cunningham just just you can't really trust him in 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 in, in all aspects. You have to be careful." And particularly, his use of Xuanzang is sometimes completely misuse rather than use. Yeah. So we have another uh, another person who raised their hands. So it's now. Now, Preet Singh, could you please ask your question and mute yourself? Um, yes. Uh, thank you. Thank you, sir, for that amazing uh, lecture uh, discussion. And I particularly agree with you on the aspect where you mentioned that it's not Xuanzang's fault. It is it's Cunningham's fault, actually. I mean, Tatang's UG is itself in a very interesting read when you just read, you know, it's a very fascinating read in itself. So uh, very quickly, I have two questions. And uh, you may answer them as briefly as you can, because I think there's a shortage of time. And the third one is going to be, I, I will be seeking in some advice or guidance. So, so the first question is, could you briefly talk about what the Chinese inscriptions are at, at Bodh Gaya? I think it was at Bodh Gaya, if I remember. What is their mm -hmm. content? Very briefly. Number two. Um, um, so it is... Um, uh, so how do we actually figure out from the Chinese transliterations, for example, from the Kusumapura example that you gave, and then and then the modern Chinese, the Mandarin pronunciation is more like it begins with chu something something, and then but then you brought it with a k sound. How do we really reconstruct uh, from the Chinese uh, nouns or Chinese names of places that Xuanzang or Fasian Fa mentions? How do we really sort of come to the Indian equivalents? So that is one, uh, like, is there a strategy about it? And then, so the third one is, um, I will be soon uh, beginning my, my studies in, in philology. And I'm particularly interested in Sino-Indian and or Chinese and Sanskrit actually texts and how do they sort of, um, they come into being or how are they translated and basically their philological, their philological aspects. So if you have any advice, uh, what is the scope like uh, of this field? And if you have some advice or guidance or tips on that. Thank you, sir. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. So I, I will try to work through these uh, two questions and uh, well, three questions. They, these are really three questions. So the Chinese inscriptions at Budgaya are, as I said, um, yeah, younger. They, they are not 
they are not Xuanzang, so they are uh, from the Song and from uh, from the uh, the Yen, the Mongol period, which means 11th century to the 13th century, right? Um, they are uh, mostly devotional uh, in, uh, of devotional content, but what is interesting uh, in these inscriptions is that, uh, of course, they give us dates. That's always the important part of the Chinese uh, textual material that they are normally date self-dating. They tell you in the second year of the reign of emperor blah, 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 and sometimes even the day and the month. So you really have uh, the historical information you you, you really would like. Um, uh, and the uh, inscriptions from Bodhgaya actually are interesting in so far as they show that by that time, when China was relatively <clears throat> self-isolating, in the Song period, for instance, right? It was a period which is normally characterized as, as a sign of self-contained China. It's not looking outside, it's rather looking uh, at the empire, that exactly in that period, there is uh, an interest from uh, the imperial side, but also from the Buddhist side to the outer world, which was exactly uh, the land of the Buddha, which is India, which is Magadha, of course. And Bodh Gaya, obviously at that time became a much more important place, which is, of course, also kind of uh, supported by uh, the reconstruction of the Pala setting of Bodh Gaya, right? That, I mean, all these statues, all these, these fabulous uh, um, uh, bronzes you have from that period, it, it, this really is, uh, is, is important uh, at that time. And the Chinese are part of this. So they are going there. And some of these uh, monks actually say that they were sent by the emperor to Bodh Gaya to collect merit. So it's the, 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 the habit of, if you like, of um, punya parinama. So the, the, the monk goes, gives something to Bodhgaya, to the community, to the temple, gets punya and transfer the punya uh, to the emperor, right? So the inscriptions are actually imperial or at least semi-imperial in some cases. So that that is uh, this astonishing feature of these inscriptions. They are well, um, well, kind of well documented uh, in uh, uh, older uh, French literature. So they were translated by uh, Edouard Chavan um, and uh, by other French sinologists. So uh, the content is, is relatively clear. There is, there is a bibliographical uh, track record uh, for these um, inscriptions. However, there is one, for instance, I'm very interested in, which, uh, well, some of them still must be around in India, uh, but uh, we were never, we tried very hard together with some of my colleagues and we are not complete, we, we have not been successful. They must, must be somewhere in Calcutta, they must be somewhere probably in the, um, in the um, uh, in the Mahant's uh, residence. We, all, we even went to the Mahant's re residence in Bodh Gaya and looked for them. No success so far, but uh, they are good, uh, well documented, and they are translated. They are philologically uh, 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 read. So that for the Chinese inscription reconstruction of names. <clears throat> yes, well, <clears throat> uh, how to where to begin? Let's begin uh, uh, with Xuanzang. Xuanzang, as I showed you, um, introduces new. Um, uh, new uh, transliter uh, transliterations. Transliterations are phonetic renderings of the Indic names, right? Mostly Sanskrit in the case of Xuanzang. Not completely. In some cases, he uses old transliterations of older Prakrit names, but his own kind of co coinings are uh, normally based on Sanskrit. And for really understanding what's going on, it's in a lot of cases very easy because there's a one-to-one -one correspondence of a Chinese character to a, a, a specific Sanskrit akshara. So uh, it's not, not that difficult, uh, but what of course you need to use is the linguistically reconstructed uh, so-called middle Chinese pronunciation of the sixth, seventh century which is there in uh, two or three different sy systemic versions. So I'm using the one by Polyplank. It doesn't really make a, a big difference because of course these uh, uh, reconstructions are uh, phonological. They are not phonetic. So they don't give you the exact pronunciation. They only give you a kind of um, approximate pronunciation of the respective Chinese character. But that's enough, for instance, to identify uh, a cerebral, right? A, a d 
in, in, in distinction to a, a dental d or t. Uh? So Pataliputra, uh, the, 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 the sound which or the character which is used clearly has uh, an indication of a retroflex of, um, you know, of, a, of, of this t, t sound. Um, in some cases, uh, the transliterations create some difficulties. And that's, of course, again, one of these case by case investigations you have to make. So you have to know um, how to use the reconstructed pronunciation of the Chinese characters. You have to know the Indian side of the story, what can go wrong on the Indian side. I mean, you know that the names are not always fully Sanskritized, for instance, some mistakes happen. Uh, mistakes, again, in the sense of comparing with the uh, assumed original form of the name. So um, some, some, uh, some reconstructions are difficult, but normally you can, you can solve them. But you have to, uh, to use the right tools, so to speak. Uh, not only using a screwdriver, that's probably not good enough. You need a little bit more tools to do that. Um, yes, and uh, number three, well, what I would now call Sino-Indian philology, there is a lot, a lot of um, material out there. A lot of research has been done on this. Um, I would um, recommend, well, I, I mean, the easiest way is you just write me uh, an individual email, right? And I can give you advice. I think that's the easier way uh, instead of um, now piling boring details about uh, Sino Indian philology on uh, on the audience. You just write to me. Uh, it's my Cardiff address. Very easily uh, retrie retrieved from the internet, and then I'll answer you. Is that okay? Uh, yes, sir. Absolutely. Thank you so much, sir. Um, so one quick question: Could you could you briefly could you also tell me the name of the the Middle Chinese construction that you have used? Pulley plank. I write that in the chat. Just hang on. Okay. It's. All right, sir. So it's a veritable dictionary where you have most of the um, uh, of the Chinese uh, of the Chinese characters in that uh, early middle, late middle, and early Mandarin uh, reconstructed form, which will help you to to really understand what's going on. All right, sir. Thank you so much. I'll definitely get in touch with you on on the senior Indian philology, and given that so much work has already been done and seeking so, yeah. guidance on what's the scope of this area. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And then we have another question by Abha Kaul uh, from Facebook. So she's actually asking, is this Kavodol site south of the Barabara cave? Uh, Professor Deeds, I was on the circuit in 2018, but didn't hear about it there. Yeah, it's. Uh, I think it's. Um, it, well, it depends what you take as a fixed point uh, at the Barabar uh, Hills, because it's not just one hill. It's it's, it's stretched, right? It's a it's it's a it's a, a stretch conglomeration of, uh, of of rocks and 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 hills, but it is. Um, I would say where we came from along the road, uh, along the Barabar Hills, it was more or less, uh, I can't zoom in here on the map, unfortunately, otherwise I could show you. Um, it's more or less um, uh, west, southwest, so a little bit down, but more or less to the west. And then you should see it um, uh, on, well, in the distance. Uh, of course, this picture I showed you is so stunning that you can't overlook it. But uh, even uh, at other times, you, you, can, you can find it. If you go to, I think if you go to Google Map and uh, you give in uh, Kawadol or something like that, one of those, because there's several uh, uh, ways of writing it, you should actually be led to the, uh, to the mountain. It's a little bit. It's a little bit uh, away from from the road, so you have to know where you're going. But it's very prominent. Uh, you you can't miss it. Thank you, sir. And then we have Chiranjeev who is asking this. Asking, hey, thank you for your talk. How accurate and laborious is identifying archaeological site with textual uh, references? 
Well, I mean, that's what I tried to show that, um, uh, of course, you don't you don't give up uh, uh, in in the first place. You don't you don't uh, you don't dismiss your text and say, well, it's all uh, it's all uh, impossible. You can't really find anything with, with the help of the text. I mean, even Cunningham has proven in a lot of cases that you can find places and identify sites by following uh, the text. My claim would only be that uh, don't don't get stuck with uh, don't get obsessed uh, to find all the places that are described in the text, uh, but also don't give up. Um, textual, contextualize, recontextualize. Try to understand what's in the text. Try to understand what is uh, on the map, what is uh, on the ground. Uh, rely. This is only possible in collaboration, as uh, our uh, um, uh, our project has shown. You need people who know the uh, who know the sites, who know the ground. You need people who have uh, the technical skills to detect, for instance. Well, satellite archaeology has helped us a lot. Uh, uh, and try and retire. And then uh, uh, information is bounced back, for instance, to me as the textual uh, scholar, and uh, and I then give my final, not, maybe not the final verdict, but at least the verdict saying, well, I mean, what you are giving me here, um, um, a satellite archaeologist uh, doesn't really help because in the text it says the following. So it has to be a, a, a real um, interdisciplinary dialogue, which, 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 which is needed really. And that's why I'm so grateful for this project because we are really um, trying this out, right? A dialogue, a constant dialogue with each other, uh, me delivering textual information, my colleagues actually transferring that into something else. And then we sit together and then talk about, well, is this really feasible what, what we've done? Yeah, we have one more person who raised his hands. So Krishna, could you, could you please ask your question? Please unmute yourself and ask. Hi, uh, good evening, sir. Thank you so much for the talk. It was very uh, enlightening and uh, thought-provoking. And uh, my question uh, is in relation to methodology, if you could indulge me, please. Uh, how difficult is it, uh, is it to... Uh, straddle two national archives given given the politics of area studies especially when we are doing ancient history per se because like you showed us with with partly put it reconceptualizes our understanding of space and time but but there are so many limitations why we can't do um, do these projects more intensively and yeah so so I'm 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 not uh, quite sure. Are you are you are you thinking of the um, um the, the for instance, let's say uh, taking the, the example of of Patna again, which is of course heavily populated. You just can go there and say, well, now move away. I want to dig. Now I want to excavate. It's not possible. Are, are you talking about th this kind of situation? No, not entirely. I'm talking about uh, working with Chinese sources as well as Sanskrit or uh, Pali or Prakrit sources. You, we are obviously dealing with two different national archives here, and uh, it's just uh, for me in India per se, it won't be very easy to uh, access the Chinese archives or just to get enough uh, this, to develop the skill set to uh, deal with two different philological uh, archives. For that matter and and of course area studies play plays in where we have our own dogmas of how we treat indian history or chinese history or so and so so especially in case of ancient history i yeah if you could talk about that well my answer probably is then a very kind of uh challenging and uh, disappointing maybe well you have to learn the languages i would say i mean um <laughs> uh, I, I started as a classical Indologist, so uh, Sanskrit, Prakrits, um, and then moved because I wanted to do what I did over the last, let's say, three decades. I wanted <clears throat> uh, to uh, to use the other material as well, so I had to learn Chinese. That's the only way to do it. Um, that, that's one thing. So as far as the accessibility of what you call the archives um, uh, is concerned, I actually can flip the whole thing around. The Chinese material is lying at your, uh, at your fingertip. 
the material uh, for 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 you well the chinese the chinese material for for doing this kind of research is there on the internet everything is there i've never failed to find a text a um uh, a uh, a chinese text that i was looking for because there are so many chinese who are inputting the texts that it's easy my problems are very often with the with the Indian with the Indian material, and I'm, I'm looking for, for for I don't know uh, some dubious article about an inscription. Uh, I can't get it because it's in some uh, very remote journal. So I have more problems, to be honest. Not 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 as much as I probably now. I overemphasize a little bit, but um, the the Indian material is sometimes more difficult to. Uh, uh, to, to get than the Chinese. The Chinese is easy. Not, not saying that dealing with the Chinese material is easy. I mean, you can get the Chinese material, then you still have to work through it. That's, that's a different matter then. Thank you, sir. I guess we have time for one last question. So it is by Narottam Vineet from Facebook. Thank you, Professor Deep, for a thought-provoking lecture. Don't you think that Shangyan account is looped, uh, lopsided with Buddhist narrative and too much re uh, reliability on textual narratives. What was the last? Can you can repeat the last the textual? What? Uh, it is like a uh, Shangyan account is lopsided with um, Buddhist narrative and too, too much re reliability on textual narratives. Uh, yeah, I fully agree. I have nothing to say. Uh, I mean, it's, uh, he's a Buddhist uh, who said that before. Uh, Divakar, or some, some of the previous uh, um, the questions uh, uh, mentioned that, that it, he's a Buddhist. He's traveling um, in Buddhist India, mostly. So when he is talking about non-Buddhist uh, uh, stuff, it's, of course, with a certain kind of uh, dismissive uh, approach. And uh, he doesn't want to go quite obviously doesn't want to go into detail. So when he goes to a place where there are more heretics, as he calls them, probably Jains or Shaiva or, or Vaishnavas, or whatever, whatever they were, <clears throat> maybe even still um, uh, still Ajivikas. He just says, ah, oh, there are so and so many uh, heretic temples and there are a lot of uh, heretics. Full stop. That's it. If you're lucky, he says, oh, the naked ascetics. And then, then you know that it's probably giants, uh, Digambaras. Digambaras. Uh, so there is. Sorry? You please unmute uh, yourself. Yeah. OK, so there, there, there is, of course, a, a Buddhist bias, right? And again, the intentionality of the text kicks in because he tries to project a Buddhist India that is appealing uh, to the Chinese court circles. That's pretty clear. But that doesn't mean if you know that, if you can actually put that filter in front of your reading lens, right? Um, I would still claim that the text, uh, and I mean, people have agreed on this, um, <clears throat> uh, you, st you still can filter out a lot, a lot of material. But if you're only looking at it through a positivist historical lens, saying, I want to find the historical objective reality, you are, you are doomed to fail. You have to, you have to use all the registers of good historical, philological um, uh, hermeneutics. And as you probably know, that is, a, that, that is a quite complex and sometimes tricky matter. Yeah. Thank you, sir. So I just wanted to ask one question since I was uh, dealing with the Western uh, Deccan region. So uh, the way I saw your map, so I don't see that uh, Zhang Yang mostly traveling in the Western Deccan region, although there are a lot of uh, Buddhist caves and all those structures. So why is it like why he's mainly focusing on the Magadha region and why not the Western Deccan region and particularly the Sopara and all? So. Well, uh, one, one part of the question you probably uh, should be able to answer yourself. I mean, uh, he wants to see the sites where the Buddha was active. Yeah. 
And that, of course, was Magadha, <laughs> more or less, right? Uh, but not only Magadha, but of course, we have, we have some, uh, some areas in, 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 uh, in, in the subcontinent where uh, Buddhist tradition claims the Buddha has miraculously gone. For instance, in Gandhara, there, there he, he gets into this long uh, uh, description of the places around Hadda, Nagarahara, uh, because why? Because there is, of course, this tradition that the Buddha flew from Magadha to this place and he, he was active there. So again, he, when this happens, when there is a place linked to the Buddha's life, then he becomes really interested. <clears throat> the other places are interesting, but they are, of course, never that fully described as the places linked to a certain event in the life of the Buddha. And therefore, the Dekan, I mean, uh, Ajanta is described, but you are right, uh, a, a lot of the other places in the Dekan, where we would say, well, but that's Buddhist, come on, you have to give us something. Uh, it's probably, it, maybe he was not really interested going there. We don't really know why he did not do something, right? It, it's speculation to say, oh, he didn't go there because... So the, the, the only plausible uh, plausibility you can construct is places where, where he actually says something about it. Yeah. yeah, thank you, thank you so much. Thank you so much, sir, for the wonderful lecture. And I guess we should officially wind up the session. So once again, I thank you on behalf of the uh, seminar committee. Uh, thanks for coming and giving a wonderful lecture on this topic. And I would really uh, thank our professors who are at attending this uh, lecture. Thank you so much for attending the lecture and special thanks to the audience both on the Zoom meet and Facebook for attending and asking such a wonderful question. And uh, ma'am, if you want to have some- yeah, I just want to thank Professor D for being here and all my questions will go into the email. Uh, I've not asked my questions yet. So hopefully uh, I'll, I'll get my answers over the email. Thank you again. And please, uh, Ashu, can you announce the next seminar so that yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. before we wind up? Yeah, so uh, thanks again. And so our next webinar is on 1st September at 3.30 p.m. Uh, it's by Dr. Ranjita Datta uh, from JNU. And she's speaking on reconfiguring the regional uh, and urbanity, differential spaces, and shared access in the temple towns of Sri Ranga. So I hope that you all join uh, on the 1st September at 3.30. Uh, thank Good you so time. much. Thank you so much for the lecture. Yeah. Good night, everybody. Good night. See you on the 1st. Thanks a lot for, for joining and all the interesting questions. Thank you. Thanks. And Seema, Seema send, send your questions by email. I will, definitely. <laughs> you can expect that, Max, definitely. Okay, but okay. Don't, 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 ex don't expect me to answer until next week because I'm going on holidays tomorrow. Oh, great. Somebody gets to go on holidays. Not me, but somebody does. <laughs> so, see, Not see very you. far, but at least. Yeah. Enjoy yourself. Thank you. Yeah. Bye. So Bye. I, I stop sharing now, right? And yeah, yes.